Let me. Uh, we okay. Go. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Thursday night edition. We're uh, nine days or so away from the uh, exam, and hopefully, everybody is really diving into these materials. Uh, we're on content domain number four this evening. We've had three great sessions. Um, if you missed any of the things that have come up so far, uh, we had Mike Holt on content domain, domain number one, verifying system design. About a week and a half ago, that's all available on the uh, website for the class and the newsletters. We had uh, Jeff Gilbert from the IEC in Chesapeake covering uh, content domain number two, project management. We had a great session on Monday with Janet Hughes of Ontility, and um, she covered installing the electrical components. And as she mentioned in her presentation, as we've been saying from the beginning, uh, if you are in or close to one of the cities where they still have training available, I'm not sure if that's coming up or happening or expiring this week at some point, but uh, you can contact Janet and people at Ontility to see if there's any way they can help you get some more hands-on or face-to-face um, -face training, which really is, is an awesome thing before next Saturday. So uh, you can go to Ontility.com and find out more about that. Um, but we're really excited here tonight. We have uh, Johan Alsen, who is very well known within the PV industry for mechanical design. He's the director of training for Quick Mount PV Systems. Uh, PV attachment. We've got some of the most uh, uh, excellent pro pro um, products with respect to flashings and systems. And in his experience there, uh, he's uh, also on the, the board of directors for the new uh, RISE certification to become certified solar roofing professionals. If you're not familiar with that, the roofing industry is getting uh, involved in solar in a big way. Uh, at the recent National Roofing Contractors Association conference that took place at the end of February in Orlando, there was a training class that was offered for RISE certification. Uh, they offered one of the first exams for the RISE certification, and uh, they're really going gangbusters putting together a bunch of information and, and information about getting certified for roofers. So I'm sure uh, Johan can uh, answer questions or tell you a little bit more about that in tonight's presentation because the uh, last one to touch the roof owns it, and we always like to tell people that you know using proper um, best practices with respect to all of this uh, attachments is, is crucial to make sure that those roofs don't leak. Uh, we had some great sessions on the weekend. We had uh, Richard spent three and a half hours going after code stuff. I was. These are two kind of informal sessions that took place Saturday and Sunday, just you know, plowing through the code book, going over sample questions. So those uh, videos of those three and a half hour sessions are available on YouTube. Again, they're very informal. We were looking things up as we went, and really the thing behind that was about, hey, we're, we're going to be putting up this information. Why not let people tune in? So there have been daily newsletters going out. If there's anybody online tonight with this presentation that's not getting the full value out of this course, please send us an email and let us know how we can help. So I'm going to turn it over now to Johan. Um, it's 5 after 5. We're going to go till uh, that's mountain time, uh, 5 after 6 central time, uh, 5 after 7 east coast time. So we will be going for right up until uh, an hour. And uh, you have opportunity to send in chats, anything you need to communicate with Johan, and uh, he's going to do an awesome, awesome job here. So let me uh, turn it over to you, Johan, uh, and content domain number right. four, installing mechanical components. All right, thanks. So um, I'm going to cover a couple things here, and I'm probably actually going to jump back and forth from a couple different slide presentations. So um, I'll let the screens adjust. I apologize for that. There's kind of two different presentations I'm pulling from and just want to make sure uh, we get all the information. So um, we got we got a lot to cover in just an hour. So um, I guess I'll, I'll go over the presentation and then I'll look at questions as they come uh, towards the end. And um, and we'll leave some time for that as well. So um, just moving along, we're going to talk about solar roofing best practices and um, what that entails. And um, just to, I guess to give you a background on myself just quickly, um, I basically started out as a solar installer for a company here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, started doing uh, installs with the folks who actually um, own Quick Mount PD currently. And I've been working for them ever since. They spawned off and started, as an installer, started doing their own uh, solar mounting systems. 
and um, it sort of took off from there. And now I'm the director of training for them. I've um, been working with a lot of groups, talking on the topic of solar roofing best practices as a whole. Um, it's been a topic that only just now in the past couple of years have gained a lot of interest. And it's somewhere where the solar industry kind of lacked um, better products and knowledge. And now things are moving on uh, pretty quickly. And now we're getting up to speed. The roofing industry is recognizing that we're, you know, solar installers are not just hippies in the woods anymore. And we're doing things correctly and want to do things correctly. So, um, so we're going to talk about some of those things. Uh, just a quick overview. Bye. There we go. Uh, quick overview. We're going to talk about what what solar roofing best practices um, means. It's kind of a term that I just kind of made up. It made a lot of sense after presenting a lot on how to do proper mounting systems, code compliant uh, mounting systems. Uh, I just came up with a term of solar roofing best practices and seemed to make a lot of sense. Uh, we'll talk about what codes and um, what is code for solar mounting systems, some of the mistakes made in the past. Uh, how to maintain roof warranties and avoid liability, um, working with the roofers, uh, when, when is a good time to call in a roofer and not just try to learn, learn the system on the roof as you go. Uh, we'll talk about some innovations in solar uh, as far as racking and uh, selling quality systems. I know everyone's trying to get the cost down uh, and also design uh, things that can help uh, cut down costs and whatnot. So moving along, um, slide's not advancing. I think there's a little bit of a delay, so I'll just, okay. So one of the biggest things is we've had a lot of problems in the industry uh, where there's been this huge disconnect between the solar industry and the roofing industry. Um, and many, I don't know if there's any roofers on board or roofers slash solar installers, and, you may know that, you know, a lot of the roofing industry doesn't like solar in the sense that solar installers are getting up there, taking their jobs and doing it uh, in the fashion of avoiding roof warranties. That's kind of the old mentality and now things have changed. Um, but there is still some disconnect between the solar industry and the roofing industry. I'd say that the industry, the roofing and solar industry, the bond between them two, the relationship has, has never been stronger than it is now. And uh, part part of that is because of these training sessions like we're hosting right now, um, education. Um, in the past, the biggest one of the biggest problems uh, is no regulation. Uh, in the building department, you know, there's different requirements in every jurisdiction. They have their own set of requirements. They traditionally go by the International Building Code. Uh, but things like flashing and waterproofing uh, haven't been something that has has been a huge concern. So we'll talk a lot about waterproofing in this and, and also mechanically attaching. So um, building departments for in some cities, I mean, California is all up to speed now, I would say, but there's still some areas in other states and other cities where there are um, – there are quite a bit of building departments that don't mandate things like waterproof flashing. So this is a big deal, and this is where we we get into some trouble on the roof, and we can have callbacks and roof leaks and things like that. Um, there's also the, you know, that there's some outdated technology. I've seen some kits go out that don't have proper waterproofing and mounting systems. Uh, the cost comp and competition aspect, a lot of people are trying to, you know, competition is fierce out there. We know how that is. I know being on an installation team myself in California, where there's hundreds of them, um, it, it's always hard to be that, that preferred contractor. So folks are trying to cut costs and cut corners. And a lot of times they cut corners on by buying cheaper products and products that are doing designs that don't necessarily pan out to be the best quality. So we're all, I'm all for uh, lowering the cost of products and installation, but maintaining high quality. So uh, training is a big deal. We have to make sure that proper training is, is done well and done to a high quality standard. Um, and the solar industry is, is new, so a lot of folks are coming into this industry, um, you know, wanting to make a buck and. Uh, I think it's important to know who the manufacturers are 
who are the credible training organizations that, that are offering good training. Some of the instructors that have already presented to you already, I've already worked with, and with a lot of great people. So, um, so the industry is growing up, basically. And so the liability issues with voided roof warranties is a big deal. And that's what we want to talk about mostly. Um, one of the number one issues is uh, roof penetrations that one of the number one issues that doesn't get a lot of um, a lot of highlight is roof penetration. I don't know if you guys remember this picture, if you've seen it, if you're a solar junkie and read the magazines like I do. Um, this was on a cover of a magazine in 2010, this picture with the two guys on the roof. And it was quite a bit of a, it was kind of an embarrassing thing for the solar industry because um, there, there's a lot of things wrong with this picture, and I'm sure you can pick them apart without me spelling it out. But one, number one, they don't have any fall protection whatsoever. Uh, so OSHA safety standards are thrown out the door right away. And uh, the penetrations are done in a way that is actually not, it's not, it's not done to the, the best design layout. The, the, the angle, the, the, Excuse me. The, the the solar mounting systems that are on this system are are not a standard solar standoff or, or mounting system. There's no flashing at all, so the penetrations are not waterproof, and and the um, and and so there's a lot of things wrong with this picture. And so this was on a cover of a magazine, and on the solar magazine just a year and a half ago, and it was very embarrassing for the solar industry and. Um, this is what the roofing industry looks at and says, you know, these solar guys have no idea what they're doing. So this is what we want to avoid. And um, so this is one of the most important things that before you step on the roof, before you even purchase any products to start the installation, it's extremely important to find out a couple key basic things about the sol about the roof. Also, uh, obviously, the, the um, most important thing is checking out the structural integrity, if solar is even possible on this roof, is it going to take the extra uplift, wind load, and, and dead loads and whatnot. So, um, but one of the things that goes uh, unspoken is finding out who the original roofer was. Uh, you're obviously going to find out who or how much light is left on the roof. So you want to check out and find out with the homeowner uh, or the building owner who is the original roofer record. Uh, where are their warranties? And there's two kinds of warranties that are going to be in place. There's the workmanship warranty uh, of the manufacturer, uh, or excuse me, the workmanship warranty of the of the roofer himself, his workmanship warranty, and then there's going to be the manufacturer's product warranty. And so when you get up on the roof and you blow a hole in the roof and you're not sure of those things, chances are you're avoiding the warranty of that roof right off the bat. You can step on the roof at the wrong temperature um, and and void the warranty of the roof. So these are things you want to do. You want to do as much research as you can um, on 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 the roof that you're working with before you step on the roof. Um, obviously, warranty is the original roofer, uh, and then you get into more investigative things like structural integrity, lifespan, waterproofing, uh, what underlining is there. Sometimes there's a roof on top of another roof. So before doing any kind of mounting system, it's extremely important to do as much research as possible, um, finding out what it to find out what the, the proper mounting and flashing system and, and, and racking system will be needed. So, uh, and then you get into designing and engineering and your layout. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight early on is um, this article that was in Solar Pro magazine. If, if you don't, I don't know who's new to solar or how many I'm preaching to the choir, but um, Solar Pro is a great magazine. It's free. Um, you can get it free if you're in the solar industry. And there was this article, the very first issue that came out in October, November of 2008, it talked about pitch roof racking. And um, in that article, roof consultant stated that um, there, he stated that somewhere around 80% of all construction related litigation comes from water intrusion. That's a huge, huge number. So before getting into re proper rack mounting systems, uh, these are things you want to pay attention to because we're not just putting in a couple penetrations into the roof uh, at solar installers. We're, we're putting in 30, 40, 50, sometimes hundreds of holes 
in the roof. So this is a, a huge liability if we don't pay attention to this. And this kind of sets the foreground for doing solar right on the roof and making sure that we don't have any liability issues. So going back to that picture with these cheap mounting brackets, this is the, the whole goop in a prayer method that I, that I typically call out because because you're basically just doing a lag bolt with some kind of angle bracket or L foot straight to the roof and, you know, putting goop on it and praying to God it's not going to leak. Um, but goop in a prayer doesn't necessarily need code. So these are things we need to pay attention to. So, um, again, uh, the evaluating the design and layout, I'm going to skip over to another slide here real quick on another presentation because um, it shows some more details and some things. Um, so you can see I've gotten a lot better at PowerPoint because this one is my generic one from a long time ago, but it's got great information. So I wanted to talk about some of these, some of these things. So we always say you got to think like a roofer and you got to act like a roofer. At some point in time, there's going to be a, a, a point on the project where you might not know the system or the roof and you might have to call a roofer and get a roofer out there to do it properly. That's more with commercial roofing systems. So we're gonna focus on residential here. And um, so uh, with residential systems, comp shingle roofs, it's not rocket science. I'm not a master roofer or anything. And uh, I've just been on the roof working with solar installations long enough that uh, I've had to assist in re-roofing. And so you understand how composition shingle roofs work. And so uh, when we're talking about code compliance, <clears throat> these are some of the big players and uh, the codes, the standards for for roof mounting, and um, Richard mentioned uh, RISE, which came, is a new program called Roof Integrated uh, Solar Energy. It's basically a certification, another feather in your cap that you can put in next to, it complements NAPSET very well, because NAPSET focuses on the electric, uh, the NEC codes for electrical, and the, um, and uh, the RISE certification focuses on roofing best practices, so things we're talking about right now, and um, maintenance of the roof and working with the solar system and how that comes into play for roofing. Mostly they're focused on commercial, but they're getting into residential as well. So, And they've invited me to be on the board of directors, and it's a great group. Uh, they're not just roofers. There are a lot of solar guys on board now, and... Uh, it's getting better and better. So like I said, the the, the, tot, the the bond between solar installers and roofers is getting much stronger. So the international, well, I guess I should start from the middle. This is kind of, this is what QuickMount made. QuickMount's very, very big on education. So um, I, I try not to push the products in this these kind of presentations, but we do a lot of education regardless of what products we we are manufacturing and making. Um, we, we are very, very big on, on training and proper education. So I'm the director of training at QuickMount, but I also do a lot of presentations uh, on this topic in general and a lot of articles for Home Power and Solar Pro and whatnot. So um, this is what we've, divide, what we've come up with for some of the big associations and groups that are involved in, um, in, uh, in the codes and standards and using best practices. So this is kind of the installer's mantra, if you will. There's in the middle, you got your AHJ uh, authority having jurisdiction, the building department inspectors uh, in order to get permits. And sometimes they refer right to international building code. Sometimes they go to NRCA's roofing best practices. Uh, there should be another group on here that ties into the NRCA, uh, which is the Tile Roofing Institute for the tile side of things. Uh, you got the Cedar Bureau. Um, with wood shake, those are getting more specific into specific roof types. Um, but groups like that, that are associations that state roofing best practices. Um, then you get ARMA, the Asphalt Roofing Manufacturers Association, uh, SMACNA, which is the Sheet Metal and Air Condition Contractors National Association, uh, that it, they state typically what size flashing needs to be installed, what thickness, what gauge metal, what type of metal. Um, and then you get into roof manufacturers uh, warranties, and UL comes into play obviously with grounding issues with fracking. Uh, right now, UL uh, 2703 is being under uh, they're having reviews for whether or not mounting systems uh, separate from racking systems need to be grounded and flashings as well. So it's stirring up a lot of stuff 
right now, and one of our guys is on the committee checking, uh, you know, keeping on track uh, with that. So it's something you'll see in the discussions with the solar ABC um, discussions happening pretty soon. Um, the International Code Council is the ICC. They are the ones who write the International Building Code. They have an evaluation service. So on some products, you'll see like a ICC ESR number, which basically means that they've evaluated the product and that it um, is certified to meet all the International Building Code standards. So all of these kind of re reference to each other. They overlap in some cases, uh, different things where they point out um, um, codes and loose and best practices. Uh, so this is just to give you an overview, and you can get some more of this information and read specific details and links to their website uh, at that URL at the bottom, quickmountpv.com, and you want to go under um, waterproof and code compliance and things like that. And there's, there's some great info on that. So just to touch on some of the codes, uh, um, the International Building Code and Uniform Building Code all state that roof penetrations all must be flashed, uh, all, all roof openings must be flashed. You know, it's like if you're a solar nerd like I am and you drive around and you see, uh, you look for roofs that are perfect for solar, you look for solar systems, you'll also notice a trend with vent pipes, skylights, and chimneys. They all have flashing coming out of their mounting systems. And something that I found in my research, uh, I found that I think it was in the 80s, they changed that the, the terminology that solar mounting systems were considered to be uh, actual roof penetration, and before they were considered roof attachments. And roof attachments don't necessarily have to go under all of the uh, all of the um, uh, standards and best practices and codes for for flashing. And so, um, with that, they saw a lot of the roof leaks happen, and then they changed it to that solar mounting systems have to be uh, are can, are in fact roof penetration and have to follow all these international building codes for roof openings and having waterproofing. So it's all good for the solar industry. We, we should be doing these things uh, as we're getting onto roofs and putting, putting racking systems up there. So, um, so with that, um, there's also something that was interesting reading some of the SMACNA codes. Um, they call out galvanized to not be installed on roofs that exceed 15 years. Uh, I know I'm blown through a lot of this real fast because there's a lot to cover, but that's a pretty big deal when you get roofs that are lasting 30 years on average now, uh, 30, sometimes 50 years, depending on the roof type. Um, galvanized is a product that's not going to necessarily meet those, those lifetime, uh, lifespans. So again, going back to, uh, one of those other slides, let's see, going back to the, other slide where we're talking about prepping. So going back to um, finding out who the original roofer is, uh, one of the main things you're going to have to do is finding out whether the roof needs to be re-roofed, how much life is left on that roof, um, and where where do the um, where, where where's the lifespan? I mean, if, if you're putting a 25 year product solar array on that roof and the roof only has six years left on it or five, um, you're going to want to maybe re-roof that roof. And then when you have new roofs coming into play, you're obviously going to have new warranties in place. So it's crucial that you install proper systems that are going to meet um, um, the roof, the roofer's needs and best practices and, and all the codes. Sorry, I didn't know why that does that. Okay, so when you're doing your design layout, um, this is all basic stuff, uh, wind zones. Uh, some go by letter uh, A, B, or C, or one, two, three. Um, but here you could see that um, if you look at that top little image um, with the roof sections, the roof zones, it's really important to know what the calculations are per job. A lot of people ask me since I'm in the mounting business and training, they they ask me how far do you span these mounts? Like it's a, a just one word answer. Um, every roof is different, uh, every truss is different, every building is going to be different. So it really depends on your design layout. So there are a couple key things to keep in mind. One, if you're putting together uh, mounting systems with a different racking system, um, they, they're they compatible, but you got to check out the engineering. So it's not, uh, you might have um, a lot, seen a lot of folks using some cheaper rails and 
uh, they end up having to put more amounts in because the engineering on the racking system isn't necessarily that good, and so you can't span far. So they're going, you know, three foot spans, two foot spans. But if you look at different racking systems that have better engineering as well as mounting systems, you can span further and end up making less penetrations into the roof and and design a great system. That picture at the bottom there is one of my favorite pictures because it, there's a lot of things to point out there. One, if you notice, he staggered the load. So he didn't he didn't install the mounting system on on the same rafter all the way up on every single rail. So I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but um, so he staggered the load. So meaning there's a mount here, then he went up to the next to the next rail and skipped over to the next rafter and he distributed the load. This helps with snow country when you get point loading or with snow loads. Um, if you distribute the load, uh, you can typically have a more a well-engineered solar system, uh, a racking system for the complete array. So with that wind zone, uh, these translate very well together because you could see A is the ideal section where to install uh, an array. Um, but a lot of times, a lot of people are trying to get a, the biggest bang for their buck on that roof space, uh, and then you've got fire codes coming into place too, where you have to have uh, room setbacks and whatnot for for firefighters to get up there and do their job properly without having any obstructions like a solar array. So um, obviously, A is the least amount of wind uplift. Well, then you get into B on the perimeters of the roof. And that's going to be your next highest wind speed. Uh, and then you get into the corners, uh, like C, or sometimes they say three if it's in numbers. Uh, that's going to be your biggest wind uplift. You got to think we're essentially we're putting sails on the roof. So um, you have you have wind uplift coming from the right side and the left side, and it can tear that entire system off the roof. So uh, if you look at this bottom picture here, you can see one he staggered the mounts. So he's distributing the load. He's got he's got pretty far spans. In some cases, he's doing six feet six foot spans. Um, and and then at the corner here, you could see where the the wind speed is very high in that C section. He installed two uh, two mounts closer together to, to anchor down the solar system. So design can if you do proper designs, you can actually use quality products and minimize your your cost. So um, all these different racking companies um, have different calculators. Unirac's got one. I believe DPW does. Uh, Iron Ridge is a great one. This is their rooftop configurator where you've got mounting systems built right into the system. And it, like I said, it's not, a, it's not a simple answer to say how many mounts you're going to need for this project. Uh, you've got to calculate a lot of different variables. Um, you've got to calculate what, what wind speed you're in, uh, what roof zone you're going to be in, uh, how big the array is, how many modules, what size modules, uh, what's obviously with the wind speed, um, point loads and snow loads between snow country. Um, and then with the racking and mounting, you're going to want to look at mounting systems. Uh, speaking from a manufacturer myself, we don't make rails. But we make them compatible with like all the different rails that are already out there. So, so you'll see that our engineering is all on pullout and shear. So it's tested how many pounds per square foot it takes to rip the bolt out of the roof or the two by four, and then also how much force downward and shear force it takes to break or, or for anything to fail in the system. So that is then calculated into uh, the rack manufacturer's span chart. So all of this can be looked at, if you look, one of the most, um, the documents that's been out there for a long time is Unirex Code Compliant um, Design Manual, and also uh, Iron Ridge has their rooftop configurator that spits out some rough quotes for your design. And you can literally put out what wind, what wind speed you're in, wind zone, uh, what modules you're using, what size, how many, uh, what racking, what mounting. And you can calculate that all out on these rooftop or these online calculators. So those are great tools. Um, so sorry, these are some of the. Now going back to now, let's get into some of the the, the fun part. Um, let's see. 
So this is my old, it's a little bit dated, but it's still very, very, uh, um, but this is all still good information. So this is the good, bad, and the ugly. Notice that the bad and the ugly is underlined because this is a big deal. I know a lot of folks are obsessed with, you know, modules and racking, or excuse me, modules and inverters, which is all very great tech stuff that we all love, but the mounting systems and waterproofing, structurally and uh, waterproofing, is a big deal. So these are some systems that should be failing certain jurisdictions. Now, the tile hook on the right, I shouldn't bash that one so much. It's just that some jurisdictions don't accept it because they want, they want flashing and waterproofing underneath the tile roof. Um, and some cases, they don't do that. So uh, I should be a little easier on tile hooks, and I'll show how, how what that is. I have some good information on tile. Um, and <clears throat> let me just check the time so we don't, I want to leave some kinds of questions. So um, the old L foot to the roof and these, you know, brackets straight to the roof. When you have an exposed bolt like that, and it doesn't it doesn't meet code. The, the national, the, the NRCA, the National Roofers Contractors Association, they call this out specifically and state that they don't want to see exposed fasteners, no matter what sealant you have. They don't want to see exposed fasteners directly to the roof like this. They want the penetration elevated and flashed properly. So, and I say properly because you can see that system on the, in the middle, that OD flashing. OD flashings are not a terrible solution. I've used them a million times, um, but they, they, their lifespan isn't always the greatest, um, depending on the type you're using and how long the roof has left. Um, but you can clearly see that that's an install error. Um, they've cut half the shingle, or excuse me, the flashing. They've cut side of it off to fit into that dormer or whatever's going on there. Then they glued it down to the roof with sealant, nailed it in. It's not interlaid into the shingles. It's just a bad install altogether. So we can make these mounts as dummy proof as possible, but we have to also keep following the instructions. Everyone needs to read instructions. So that is key. Um, you don't want to avoid the product's warranty and so on. Um, conduit mounts as well. Um, that's a pretty old school method you see to the left there with the old wood block underneath the conduit lagged into the roof, another goop and a prayer method that isn't giving necessarily any code. So um, these all violate roofing best practices and codes. So uh, we want to make sure that we avoid those. So getting into this in further detail, what's wrong on a on specifically on a composition shingle roof, the reason why some of these, these uh, exposed bolts and sealant methods do not meet codes and they're not accepted in the roofing industry and shouldn't be accepted in the solar industry as well, is because these comp shingle roofs, I'm guessing you can see my face, so I'm making hand gestures here, but these composition shingle roofs, they expand and contract and they get hot and cold. And with that comes the expansion and contraction and they move slightly. So over the years, the roof moves just a bit. And with that, you get the, the, the sealant breaks open. No matter how how good the sealant is, no matter what they swear by, um, it's just not going to hold up uh, in, in most cases. We have to think, you know, 30 years. We want the system to outlive the entire array itself. So this picture on the bottom left, you can see it's a great example of how that bracket, you can see it's sinking into the composition of the shingle roof. And what's happening is... Uh, the roof is getting hot and cold, it's expanding, contracting, and it's getting soft, and the bracket is sinking into, into, the, uh, um, into the comp shingle and creating a dam or a moat for water to collect and pool and sit there. So um, this is a big deal. I mean, in Northern California and any area where it's, it's raining a lot, um, this is going to be a huge liability issue down the road. So, um, so if these systems are installed on a roof, no matter – what roofer is there, no one's going to stand by this and it will, it will be void, and result in avoided roof warrant. So this is another great example where the roof expanded and contracted and it broke open the seal and you can see on the right where there's some corrosion and the mounting system did uh, leak and failed. So um, this is, again, uh, an exposed fastener that we want to avoid. Um, another one, I'm getting through all the ugly ones first, but um, 
looking at the left, the one on tile, I could see where the installer was going with this because a lot of those ridge caps that you see on the top there, that um, some of that condo is going over, they, they'll mortar in some of the, uh, uh, the tiles so they don't blow off the roof. And so I guess they thought uh, they'll just build a little mountain of mortar around the post and call it good. But that is definitely not going to meet code, hopefully not inspection either. Um, you can actually see the pipe down below, there's a little vent jack where that has flashing underneath the tile and they notched around the tile. So I'll talk about that, that in a minute. Um, the other thing is some of the technology that I mentioned, as I mentioned before, is, is, is getting outdated. So the old school methods that you see on the right, uh, some of those boots fail. They, they, they corrode and they crack and they, get, they, they break open. So some of these systems are um, not lasting as long as roofs uh, are intended to last uh, in this day and age. So now roofs are lasting up to 30 years, uh, depending on the roof type. Sometimes they're 50. Um, a tile is a pretty durable roof. Um, but these comp shingle roofs, typically they're a 30-year product. And this flashing that you see it failed there, that's a 15-year product. So it doesn't really make sense to install that underneath the 25-year solar system. Uh, the one on the left is just kind of a bonehead mistake that someone made with the design. The flashing doesn't necessarily meet all the way up into the nail line. So this is actually just little small details that are very, very essential to uh, waterproofing on the roof. So this, this little seam that I'm pulling apart here in this picture, that's what they call a keyway. And um, it's a seam, it's a break in between the, the shingles, the two shingles come together um, and they're nailed at the top uh, end of this course here underneath this shingle. So your flashing needs to be reaching up into that nail line. You can see where the finger's pointing there, uh, that flashing ends halfway up that keyway. So what that means is you totally de defeated the purpose of, excuse me, of, um, of waterproofing or, or the flashing in general. So water gets under the keyway, builds up on this on the flashing and comes down to the roof penetration and, and gets into the hole. And, and you know, water damage doesn't show up right away. Uh, it's depending on the on the construction, the severity of the of the leak. Uh, you might not see roof damage from a roof leak five or six years down the road. Sometimes it takes a, a while for it to seep in rot the roof on the on the top portion on the exterior and then start rotting the wood on the interior so these are things that won't come up for a couple of years down the road um, so now in solar we're in that age where some of the old systems uh, from the 80s are coming back to haunt us uh, especially with the solar hot water revolution that happened in, sol in the 70s and 80s uh, where they were just putting solar systems up with or solar thermal systems with blocks of wood i mean those are, are leaking all over the place in, in california so getting to some more of the positive side and what solutions have come up, uh, you have the uh, these all-in-one flashing and mounts, like Quick Mount is, is pioneered. Uh, we've, we've taken off in this area where we've made the mount integrated into the flashing itself. There's also other uh, manufacturers like TTI, EcoFasten. Uh, they, they've made some great products that, that are all-in-one flashing mounts. Um, and then you get uh, on the right, this is the old OD flashing. I don't want to knock OD flashing too much because they are proper roof, uh, roofing and waterproofing. It's just some of the lifespans don't last as long and certain galvanized products. So you just have to be careful with galvanized versus aluminum. So uh, aluminum has a 50-year lifespan, um, and anodized aluminum is going to last even longer, um, which you see on the left, that black flashing on the top left corner of the picture. Um, and then we got tile. Tile, you, you have to double flash. I'll get into the, uh, these all in detail specifically by roof tiles in a minute. Um, so the underneath that flashing on that curved tile roof, you see there, there's also a flashing underneath, and I'll show that in detail. And then conduit mounts. There are some conduit mounts that are flashed options so that you can – it shouldn't be an option, really. It's, it's flashing that comes with the, with the conduit mount that, that waterproofs. The, the conduit, um, raising the conduit off the roof. So getting into the composition roof, this is one of the more popular roofing systems out there for residential systems, uh, composition or asphalt shingle roof. So there's different methods. 
this, now the old style, which is still very popular today, is the the old standoff post and flashing. You have a post, you can use an OD flashing, or QuickRun has a flashing as well, a standoff post and flashing like this you see here. Um, so I'll get into that in the details uh, in the next slide. And then you also have the all-in-one flashing amount, which is a newer system that's come into play since the early 2000s. And when I say all-in-one flashing and mount, it's just like it sounds, it's the, the mounting system is incorporated into the waterproof flashing. So everyone has a different style of waterproofing here uh, um, at the penetration. So it, it, in some cases, it means you don't have to cut the roof shingles anymore, and you can, you can mount in the middle of the course, and the flashing does the waterproofing, and your product here, the mount does the waterproofing all-in-one. So they're great for retrofits because you can slide them in, bolt them down, attach your racking system, and you're set to go. Um, with the, the standoff post and flashing, I would tend to lean towards new roof construction. Uh, it doesn't have to be new construction, but a lot of times, like in Colorado, they're doing a lot of new roofs because of hail damage, and which means they're very uh, reliant on their warranty because there's a lot of hail damage that happens on comp shingle roofs out there, and their warranties cover that. So tearing down the roof, putting down these standoff posts, um, we'll, we'll go over that. Oh, I guess I have these backwards. So let's talk about the all-in-one flashing and mount and that first. So these ones, this is just a little drawing of the product you see right here on the right. So this is the all-in-one flashing and mount. So the most important thing that you see here is that the flashing is getting interlaid into the shingles, meaning it's on top of one shingle course and under the next shingle course to get up into the nail line. And then the waterproofing is done inside of this block. So the way we do that quick mount is we have this aluminum collar that's attached to the flashing and water can't get in because it's all welded. It's all one piece. And then the, the, the penetration is elevated and then you have the uh, hardware for attaching the rack system that you see uh, here. So one thing that, to, oh, there's a blow up picture of exactly. So a lot of people ask what's going on in the block. For this product, it's a, it's a welded flute channel here. So this flashing is all one piece. You have the EPDM. EPDM is a really high heat resistant rubber. So you have this gasket that comes down, caps off this collar. You have another EPDM donut, caps off the block. And then you have your racking system on top. And so there's multiple levels of waterproofing. Um, so when that, um, the way this works is basically you need to break the natural seal. This is on a retrofit. You break the natural seal underneath the shingles. Make sure you're not tearing up the shingles. These, especially in hot areas like Arizona or California, uh, when it's real hot out in the day, these, these shingles get very soft and I should have put in a picture where, where um, what, what you could do to, um, to protect these roofs when you're working out there. There's something called spaghetti foam or spaghetti mat. It's just a generic term, but if you go to, uh, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you, <clears throat> you ask for a spaghetti mat, it basically looks like yellow spaghetti or orange spaghetti just glued together, and it's a mat you can roll out, and it's kind of rubbery. And a lot of times you can roll that out onto the roof, or some people use uh, what they use in carpets, the little foam that goes in there. You just want to make sure it, it, it's not sliding. It's got to be um, secure to the roof um, or, or have a rubber kind of stick, uh, some kind of an adhesive with something kind of sticking to, to, the, to the roof. So um, it's typically a rubber that, that doesn't slide. And when you do that, you can protect the tracks that you're making on the roof. So when you're walking up and down the roof, especially in hot days, you can really damage those shingles. So um, you want to pay attention to the temperatures on the roof. So with that in mind, you are also you're also um, wanting to um, when you get up there, a roofing bar. The roofing bars that have the the sharp tips, uh, they're, they're called shingle rippers. Great tools. They're bigger and they have a little slight bow to them and a raised handle, so you can get it underneath the shingles. You have to break that natural course or that natural uh, seal in between the shingles. It will that will seal itself up with the heat of the day, no problem. Um, so you break that natural seal, and you want to be careful that you don't tear the shingles. You don't want to lift up too hard. You just gently get under there, 
move side to side, up and down, and you can uh, break that natural seal to, to get you flashing a little bit. And then after that, you'll, you'll realize if there's any nails going to be ex- obstructing the flashing from getting up into that nail line and being waterproof. Sometimes you don't hit any nails. Sometimes you might hit one or two. So if that's the case, that, that roofing bar has a sharp tip and hooks on the sides. You hit the nail, uh, pop it out, and, and get in the shingle, of course, above and, and pull out the nail without damaging the roof. And I've done training videos on our website that are like quick tips. And they show you how to properly do that. We slow it down, so we show you how to pull out the nail. Um, so once you've done that, you you do your design layout. One thing I didn't touch on, a lot of people ask the question, is how do you find rafters? Like, I have the one golden answer, but um, I get that question a lot. But, you know, no roof is the same. So um, there's different fi- ways to find the rafters. You can look at underneath the... Uh, underneath the bays and from the ground, and you can typically see the tail ends of the rafters coming out. Uh, if that's not available, um, sometimes the gutters are nailed to the ends of the rafters. Um, and obviously getting in the attic is the best uh, way. Um, if you get into the attic, you can determine where the rafters are and transfer a measurement points to the roof. Um, if you don't, if you're out of all those options, some folks will just, you know, do the little roof dance and weigh it out and seal it out and use a mallet gently and um, seal it out. And then you get a long, small pilot bit um, and you shoot for it. And typically what I do, if this is the you know worst case scenario, you go down with a small but long pilot bit um, and drill into the roof. And then you take Obviously, you really, really need to have chalk with you so you can circle those pilot holes and go back and waterproof those. So can, that can just disappear, you know, with the heat of the day once you turn around. So um, you circle that. If you miss, you, you'll feel it sink down. You take a, 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 you know, wire and go through there. I used to just take coat wire, coat hanger wire and go through there, find the rafter, and you can figure it out from there and measure, you know, 24 or 16 inch on something. Um, every roof is going to be different. So with that, you have your chalk lines laid out, finding the rafters. You've got chalk lines going across the roof so where you want your racking system to be. Um, and then <clears throat> and then you can uh, go forward and install a mount. So once you figure out where the rafter is, you have your layout. You drill a pilot hole at the angle of the roof um, into the rafter and out, and then you put in the appropriate sealant. That's one thing that folks don't pay attention to pay attention to what sealants you're using because not all sealants are created equal. Um, some of them don't get along with asphalt materials. So like Superflex 1A was one that was used for eons and now they found out that it doesn't, it's not compatible with asphalt shingle roof um, or asphalt material, I should say. Um, so you want to pay attention to things like that. And um, also, um, Oh, we only got 10 minutes, so let me move along here. We got a lot to cover here. So uh, Chemlink M1, GSL 4500, 5500, those are good sealants. The roof manufacturer is going to spec out what sealants you should be using. So you clear out that, that, that you put in the sealant into the pilot hole, and then, um, oh, good question. Oh, now I see the question. Uh, Chemlink M1 is one that I've seen that's an awesome sealant uh, that's used for asphalt material. Um, <clears throat> And and it's it's let's see the material of it. I'm forgetting the name, and I don't want to see the, say the wrong thing. But um, so uh, there was an article on sealants. I believe it's that same article that I'm talking about. Forgive me for not knowing it right off the top of my head. I'll get that to you guys. Uh, shoot me an email. I have it at the end of this presentation, and I'll get that to you. I just don't want to uh, hang up time too much. But um, uh, so we have. So once you drill that pilot hole, you always want to backfill your, your, the hole um, with sealant so that your threads are waterproof. And it's not relying on that, but it's just to waterproof your threads and the lag bolt. And then you slip the flashing in underneath. <clears throat> excuse me. And there we go. And then you take your bolt and drive it down. And with this product, I mean, every product has a different sealing method. But with this product, it has a sealing gasket that's, on, that's attached to the, the, the hanger bolt drive that down into the rafter, it seals in that block, you put in the extra gasket there, and then you put on your rail on top. So 
every mounting system that's out, oh, I shouldn't say every mounting system, but most mount manufacturers are making their system compatible with a racking system or they have their own racking system. So since Quick Mount doesn't do any uh, racking systems, we do engineering with uh, partners and racking systems. We make them compatible with all the different racking systems. So um, that's a good and important thing to keep in mind, that if you're mixing and matching, you want to make sure that the engineers are working together. So at the bottom, you'll see that picture again. That's a great layout. With L feet, uh, you can get, you can adjust with different heights um, within the L bracket. Uh, if you have flush mounted systems like Pro Solar, uh, you're flush to the mount. So you either have to shim with the different dips and curves in the roof, um, and they have some of those different options. Uh, on new constructions, like I mentioned, you put your standoff down first, and then the flashing goes on as the roof material is getting down. This is basic roofing best practices as it's trying to sound. A lot of roofers are much more comfortable with this system. It's a great, it's a win-win for the solar installer and the roofing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the roofer, because you're putting down the standoff, uh, you're, you're, you're putting the standoffs where you want them. You make sure that they're in with your design layout. Um, and then you have the roofer take all the responsibility for waterproofing and he'll roof around the mount and then he'll add the flashing as he goes and then waterproof it um, with, with collars and, and flashing um, <clears throat> that's specced out by either him or you as a solar installer. So, um, this is a, a really great method to keep the waterproofing under his warranty and not worry about that if you don't want that uh, liability. And it also allows you to work with roofers uh, hand in hand. So this this is very standard. This is what they're doing for vent pipes and skylights and, and whatnot. The same practice where they're just roofing around it and then they're flashing as they go. Um, <clears throat> wood shake roofs, I won't get into too much, but if you look at that picture there on the left, the way some of these wood shake roofs are done, um, they have interlays of felt paper and sh and courses of shake, and so they interlap, so they, they overlap each other in there, and so they're interlaid into each other. And so what you want to do is you want to get a bigger 18 by 18 flashing that slips under the wood shake and underneath the felt paper and works with the natural waterproofing system of the roof. And and <clears throat> typically you're going three inches of embedment into the rafter uh, to get you know, a, a pretty standard pull-out string. Tile. So I know we're running out a little bit out of time, but tile is a, a pretty important one. Um, because we got five minutes. So I do want to leave questions. Tile, like I said, this is I mean, an hour's never too much. I can talk about this forever. So tile, I really want to get into. I did write an article on tile roof systems uh, in Solar Magazine. I can't tell you off the top of my head what article it was in, or sorry, what issue it was. But it uh, is on our website if you want to dig it up, um, or you can just email me and I can send it to you. But I talked about tile roofing systems um, in general and and what uh, involves in tile mounting. Because a lot of guys, especially in Northern California, they're scared of tile. Because tiles, you know, it's 50-50 comp in tile here. But Southern California and Arizona, it's just nothing but tile country out there. So you got curved tile or Spanish tile. And then you got flat tile. The most important thing to keep in mind is that the, if you look in the middle there, um, that is the Tile Roofing Institute's uh, page in their manual for roofing best practices for tile. So again. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, His audio needs to call back in. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. 
We're going to have Johan call back in in just a minute. I'm so back. We'll get that happening. All right, great. Yay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm in an area that doesn't get the best reception. I had no choice. Okay, sorry to lose you guys there. Um, so, Tile, I was getting to double flashing. So, the, the Tile Roofing Institute states um, this is their roof penetration flashing portion, and they're talking. <clears throat> the reason why you have to double flash, I found this out when I was doing my research on this article for Solar Pro, and uh, it was really interesting. And I found out that uh, in the 80s, again, a lot of things happened in the 80s, not just bad hairstyles and 80s music, but also code changes. Um, we had a lot of code changes, and uniform building code was in play at that time. And what changed is <clears throat> for roofing, the, they required that all tile roofs had to be uh, installed with underlayment uh, underneath, felt paper, or in Florida or hurricane country, it's, sometimes it's an adhesive butyl or ice and water shield. Um, so, but it's typical that it's a felt paper underlayment, whether it's 50 pound or 30 pound felt paper. And it's overlapping about three feet apart typically um, <clears throat> on the overlap. So they want us to, so now that we're penetrating, excuse me, going back, the reason why they do this, they changed the code is because getting a lot, they were getting a lot of roof leaks because underneath tiles, uh, it's old style like Europe to have, um, we're having to see, uh, you're starting to see, um, they were starting to see that the, that the tiles were not actually waterproof and water was getting in and then felt, uh, or excuse me, the underlayment, whether it's a felt, uh, a butyl or peel and stick. Uh, I saw someone said chalk. Did you mean an underlay, a chalk underlayment, I'm guessing? Um, I haven't seen that myself, um, but <clears throat> felt and uh, ice and water shields typically the most uh, popular. But um, so, so what they want us to do, is, since you're penetrating through the entire roof system, you have to waterproof at the felt paper underlayment level and also the top tile level. So that's what you're seeing in that middle picture is that <clears throat> the page cut straight out of their uh, manual. And um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so uh, so that is a deck flashing at the top picture and a tile flashing at the bottom. So there's different ways to do that waterproofing at the underlayment level. If you look, if you look at the left picture, that is a uh, a retrofit where they put in uh, a mounting system and then a flashing, a, a, deck, a smaller deck flashing, and then they have the felt paper. Uh, sometimes the felt paper ends in your course. If that's the case, you can slip it underneath the underneath the overlap and, and, and staple it in, or excuse me, nail it in and overlap the felt and you're good to go. Um, but here the overlap is two courses above. So what we did here is you take a piece of felt paper, slip it under the batten, and slip it underneath that overlap and reinforce the waterproofing. You know, bead a ceiling down here and staple it in, and, and you're good to go. So there's not a lot of wind going on at this level. The wind is happening at the top tile level, which the tiles are protecting it from. So, um, so that felt paper is the last barrier. The picture on the right is the three-course method. And so that's following, if you read the fine print in here, it says uh, optional stripping three coursing with asphalt roofing cement and reinforced fabric for installation of deck flashing when permitted by the building official. So they're saying that this, this three course method is an option. And what they do there is they put down the deck flashing and they do a, 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 a layer of, of roofing cement, which is like a Karnak or, or some kind of roofing cement that's compatible with the felt paper. And they'll smear that around the flashing and then they'll add a layer of, of, of uh, mesh or a reinforcing fabric, as they stated there, and then they'll do another layer of felt so that it bonds together and has a good feel. And so a lot of guys in Southern California like that because they, only, they only have to take out a few tiles and then run that, that roofing cement over it. So that would be the underlayment flashing, and then they do, uh, and then they would get into, there we go. So, and then they get into the top tile flashing. So here's a kind of quick and dirty of the installation process on a tile roof. So for a mounting, for a mounting system on a tile roof. So you want to strip a, a few tiles. You don't have to take out that many in there. That was just kind of for pictures. Um, but you mount to the rafter uh, with two lag bolts typically. Um, and then you, and
and then <clears throat> excuse me, and then you choose the, the waterproofing method. Here they're doing the, that kind of bib method where they reinforce the felt paper underneath the overlap, and and then they um, staple it in and, and use a bead of sealant underneath. You always want to use a bead, a U-shaped bead of sealant underneath that that flashing so it sort of bonds to the, the felt. And then you have to cut the tile. And uh, when you cut the tile, you can use a diamond blade or a grinder. I know a lot of guys are scared of cutting tile, but honestly, if you have a, a good diamond blade on the grinder um, that's a plug-in, it's actually not very hard. They cut pretty well. And um, some folks will either notch out a hole. You can get some hole saws, too, that punch through that have a diamond tip. Um, or some, some roofers I've seen like to cut from the bottom edge up. I'm assuming you can see my cursor that I'm moving around, but um, they cut from the bottom edge and up and around around the mounting, and then they'll tuck the flashing underneath the, uh, the, the tiles. So that's a method I've seen done by roofers just to tuck it underneath the tiles and kind of keep it more a little, a little more aesthetically pleasing. Okay, cool. Um, I saw that message. Thank you. Um, so this is what it's going to look like in the end. Um, you can see, you can see the, the flashing at the top. Um, you can't see the flashing at the bottom, the, the deck flashing, but these are all waterproof underneath the, underneath the tile. So again, here is a great example of how uh, they sort of staggered the mounting systems as they went where they could, uh, depending on the layout. Sometimes you have to go around vent jacks and, and, and vent pipes and chimneys. So uh, in this case, they were able to stack and stagger in certain areas. In some cases, you can't. It's not a terrible thing um, but to go up the same rafter, but you just want to make sure you're hitting dead center into the rafter. You have the right size pilot hole so you don't split the beam, um, which is typically a 60 to 70% of what your 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 anchoring bolt is going to be. So if you're using a, a 5 16th bolt, which is pretty standard, um, oh, nice, Brett, thank you. 75% should be corrected. Uh, about that's right, 75% um, of the of the bolts. So if you're using a 5 16th, uh, we've called out either quarter inch, which is a little a little on the heavier side, um, or if you've got tough wood, you can do a quarter inch or a um, 7.30 seconds to be a little bit more exact um, on a 5.15. So, um, and, and all of this is kind of, is, is more going back to, um, you know, the Wood Council. I don't know if you have that handbook of the Wood Council. Um, I, my questions that get brought up here only come for a split second. I want to try to get through all these questions. Um, well, let me get to that too at the end. Um, there are a couple other roof types that I wanted to just briefly touch base on because I know there's a lot of metal out there that you guys are dealing with. Uh, we, I don't see a lot of metal roofs out here in California, but I help a lot of guys uh, get uh, familiar with it. So um, there's a lot of companies, you know, S5 has been a huge help in that industry Yeah, <clears throat> that, that has um, great mounting systems that are non-penetrating. The one thing I do want to say about this is I, I think these are fantastic products where you, on a standing seam roof, where you're clamping onto the standing seam, you're avoiding penetration, so the waterproofing is not an issue, which is great, and if you can avoid penetration uh, and waterproof issues, that is great. Um, but one thing I've seen, like the city of Portland do, that is very, very uh, essential to these designs, is that, again, we're putting basically a big sail on the roof. So we, the pullout strength, of that system is governed by the pullout strength and relying on the pullout strength of that actual roof. So a lot of folks, um, a lot of folks um, who are doing metal roofs uh, have to get extra engineering or, or if further engineering to determine if the roof, the roof pullout strength itself can take that extra uplift that's happening on the system. So great products, but you just have to check the engineering. Uh, in Portland, they require a lot of engineering to be thorough. I just saw somebody state that at the, you know, on the East Coast, I think it's one in 20 roofs for metal. Uh, same thing in, in the Midwest, a lot of metal roofs. And a lot of snow country in you know, Colorado, um, it, it, there are a lot of metal roofs. Another option for anchoring into a metal roof, like a, like a corrugated, not a, not a standing seam, but a corrugated roof. I've seen these bolts that are made. Um, a lot of different manufacturers make them. Quickmount doesn't make anything like this but I've seen a couple other manufacturers 
um, like Schleder and, and, and uh, Ujot and other couple of companies make these bolts where they're specialized to go, it's a big hanger bolt, and it basically goes down, like you see in that black and white picture, goes down through the metal. You have to do a pilot hole first, obviously. Um, you go down through the metal, through the wood, to the, to the rafter, and you anchor down just enough to where you have this oversized rubber, uh, it's an EPDM rubber gasket that is very, very thick, and it goes down and squeezes around the bolt, and then you shim, uh, you, you shim off of the hanger bolt side, uh, or excuse me, the machine bolt side of the hanger bolt. So that's, that's a common method I've seen. Uh, it's not the most glorious method. Um, the roofing industry, you know, they don't really like exposed fasteners, even on metal roofs, which is baffling to me, but some of these metal roofs are attached with exposed fasteners, with gaskets, so it um, depends on the jurisdiction, to be honest. They're going to check out if they'll accept this method or not, but um, again, different options, uh, either penetrating or non-penetrating system for metal roofs. Uh, let's see if I can get to... Oh, commercial. I just wanted to talk about commercial. Okay, I saw that question pop up about silicon. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to pull up all the questions. Um, sorry, I'm kind of new to this system. Oh, here we go. In the chat section. This little. Um, so, you know, um, folks, I just want Johan, um, just to break uh, in temporarily. It's, it's about eight minutes after six. We still have most of the people that signed on still okay. online. So we have gone over in previous sessions, if the people don't mind, this is great information that you're giving. So please go ahead and answer what questions that you can and attendees. Anyone who has to jump off, um, this will be recorded and it will be available through the newsletter. On our, on the, on, and so you can come back and look at the part that you might miss here and if you have to leave. Um, but uh, we're going to go ahead and let Johan keep going if he's willing um, because there's so much great information here. So go ahead and... Uh, don't worry, don't worry about the time. You're really helping these folks out a lot. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay, great. Um, Craig, I saw your comments on um, that you're seeing a lot of chalk products and mastic being installed, which is actually damaging the roof systems because they're not compatible with the materials and chemicals which make up uh, the roofing system. That's a great point. Like I said before, there was an article in Solar Pro that talked about Sikaflex 1A which um, I wish I had the magazine right on me, but I think it was a silicone-based uh, product, but it had something in it that didn't necessarily meet all the right uh, um, standards. And it wasn't, it basically in their fine print, they stated that it's not compatible with asphalt material. So I don't have like the number one solution for this. Uh, there's different roofing products used for different roof types. I've seen a lot of, um, a lot of, I mean, Chemlink has, has been one of the experts in geocells. Well, I know the name brands, but the roof manufacturer, the sealant, to answer the sealant question, um, roof manufacturers in their spec sheets, they're going to kill, they're going to, they're going to call out their recommended and approved sealants. And in there, they'll say name brands like geocell and Chemlink. Uh, but they're mostly going to refer to the properties that make up those products. And so that's where you're going to find the, the, the exact answer for your exact project. So just make sure that it is compatible. There's different silicones, different uh, polyurethane uh, um, products, but not all of them are are the one solution. So, again, I know uh, we shouldn't talk name brands, but I've seen some Chemlink demonstra demonstrations. Uh, Chemlink N1, M1 is a popular one here in California because it's non-solvent based, which, you know, environmental regulation in California is, is you know, very high. So that is a big, big deal. And, and a lot of times they say you can install that even in the rain, underwater. And I know you can't do that with geocell, which some people like because it's not sticking to your hands if your hands are uh, a little wet or whatnot. So different products, different uses, and different, you know, properties make up those products. But I'm going to, again, say go back to the roof manufacturer's recommended suggestion of feeling. So, okay, now I'm going to get through some more questions. Sorry. Oh, good question. Um, uh, one came up about how do solar installers uh, 
come out and walk on tiles without breaking them. Um, one solution is send the smallest guy. <laughs> I was always that guy climbing on tile roofs because I, I was the smallest one on the crew. And uh, there is a gap. Keep in mind, there's going to be a, a gap between the tile and then the decking. And then those tiles are on a, a batten. So let me go back a couple pictures. Um, I want to go back a couple pictures because I know there's one that shows uh, the tile exposed and it shows the, the anatomy of the tile. Um, let's see. So um, with tile roofs, oh, sorry about that. I'm trying to find the tile. Here we go. So with tile roofs, you're going to get that. If you look at that top picture there, um, you're going to get the, 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 the battens that go across. The battens hold down. Uh, the top edge of the tile, so they're sort of hanging on the batten, and then there's going to be an overlapping tile on that. So that's where you're going to get the most support, right where um, you see my cursor there, right where this tile is sitting on top of this tile. So typically in the valley area where you have less, um, <clears throat> you could step really in this, any area here, but really on the edges of the tile, depending how brittle the tiles are, some of them are more robust, some of them are fragile. So typically where they overlap here, where it has support. So this tile is being supported by this tile underneath, just about two inches. So going over this nail line, you're going to see this tile. So that's a good place to keep your eyes and, 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 and step there so you don't break the tiles. Once you get into stepping on the middles of the tile, that's where they're going to crack and break. And sometimes you just can't avoid breaking tiles. So one solution that's quick is... <clears throat> When you take out a tile, flip it over and check out who the manufacturer is. It's, a lot of times it's etched right into the tile, like Monier or Life Tile um, uh, there, or Eagle. They're very popular ones uh, like that that are etched into the back of the tile. And then you can go, if you break a couple tiles, go to the local roofing yard, and they'll have extra tile. They have scraps out in the roof yard, and you can match the tiles that's what it's for, or replacing tiles that are broken. So. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but um, that's one way to avoid breaking tiles is stepping on these overlapping sections here, typically in the valleys that and on um, the, the manufacturer. And then I did want to talk about uh, the old cap and barrel style Spanish tile, the more and more traditional ones. Literally, when they're you, know, you got a cap and a barrel, they're doing this uh, uh, hook in kind of deal where they're sitting on one that's underneath here, those are extremely fragile. And I wouldn't even, I mean, you just look at them and they break. It, it, it's really tough to walk on. So a lot of what people do is they'll take those, that section of the tile out completely, and then they'll roof, they'll have a roofer roof in composition shingles, and then they'll install a solar system on the comp shingles, and then they'll tile around the solar system. It's actually a very, very slick system and looks really good. So um, that's one option. They call that like the strip and go method or something. I think I talked about that in the tile, the tile uh, article as well. And if you can't find that, just let me know. Okay, I'm going through questions again. So if you have them, please feel free to type them in or you can email them to me after. Actually, that reminds me. Let me go to my email so you have my contact information for questions. Um, so there's my email, Johan. A-O-H-A-N at quickmounttv.com. Uh, that's just my office line. Um, you can call the office. Or just I Really, I'm best about email. I'm, I'm on the road a lot. Um, so if you have questions, you can, you can shoot me a line there. Uh, so there's some other questions I'm just going through here. Uh, Okay, I guess just comment. Oh, I guess that's it. Any other questions you guys have? I'm only seeing a couple. Looks like we got to them. I saw a lot of uh, a lot of questions about sealant. Um, I can't just say if silicone is going to be the uh, an adequate sealant. Uh, like again, the roof manufacturers are really going to be the the they're going to call that one. Uh, the roof manufacturers that you're working on, they're, they're GAF, Owens Corning, um, they all uh, Malarkey, they all state what. Um, what what sealant is best to be used on that. And if you're looking for this presentation, I don't know if I have this exact one, 
on the QuickMount website, but I have one that's very similar. It has all the same information minus some of the metal stuff because we don't do metal. Um, but it's on our website. Our, our website's actually pretty handy just from an educational standpoint. Uh, I, I highly recommend going there and checking it out. There's a waterproof section that gets into codes and some of these big players. And then we have a calendar there for webinars and trainings and all that. And, um, <clears throat> and I heard I heard Ontility was on some of these calls. They are great for training as well. A lot of these groups and distributors are getting well into the training, and so I'm really happy to see that happening now as well. So thanks for your guys' time. Sorry I went over a little bit. And uh, let me know if you have any other questions. Hello there. Richard, you want um, to... Yeah, I'm still here. This is Kathy here. Um, I'm using Richard's machine, so that's his name. Uh, but um, we will uh, make this available on the um, newsletter and on the uh, Solar Move page on our website for anybody that wants to see it. And again, at the bottom of the screen, you should still see uh, Johan's uh, email and phone number if you're going to contact him. We'll also be posting answers to some of the practice press questions we've been given, um, giving out the last couple of days. So uh, keep tuning in to the uh, emails that are coming out and the newsletters. And uh, we have on Monday, Jim Dunlop is going to be presenting on content domain number five, which is uh, um, coming up on Monday again at 6 o'clock Central Time. So look forward to seeing everybody and uh, keep those cards and letters coming. And remember, uh, connect with each other. Use the forums, use the websites, use the ways to get to each other so that you can start setting up your own study groups. We've got a whole weekend coming up. We're going to have a special presentation this weekend from Kenny Grieger, who's going to present on uh, off-grid systems on one of our weekend seminars. So listen up for an email coming out on the invitation to that with a time. and. Um, one week in county, uh, one week till the exam. So thanks, everybody, so much. Thank you, Johan. You did an awesome job. Really appreciate that. And uh, we'll be in touch with everybody soon. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye now.